Good evening once again. My name is Christopher Miller, Senior Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Welcome, well, I'm here to welcome you on behalf of our president, uh, our staff and our volunteers and our board uh, to our Freedom Lecture with Phil Armstrong from Enslavement to Prosperity. Uh, it's important that uh, we celebrate, especially this month, uh, for those that might be aware, September is International Underground Railroad Month. Uh, Ohio, the state of Ohio, becomes the 12th state uh, in the nation to proclaim September as International Underground Railroad Month. And so this program is in conjunction with the backdrop of International Underground Railroad Month. So you might be wondering why September, right? Well, this will coincide with uh, the escape of two very influential freedom seekers and abolitionists uh, and heroes and sheroes, and that would be Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Uh, them on their journey uh, to freedom in the month of September. And so that's why September is the selected month. Their stories and the story you're gonna hear about tonight really embodies uh, the struggle and resilience of black folks over a period of time. Uh, we've endured enslavement for countless generations and the resiliency would see them through racist legislation, a war, the abandonment of reconstruction and continued acts of violence and hatred. Greenwood, an historic freedom colony in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was one of the most prominent concentrations of black prosperity during the 20th century. After the Civil War, most of all black townships that had been established in the United States were located in Indian and in Indian in Oklahoma territories. One of those townships was Greenwood. It was created in 1906, which is an outstanding year. <laughs> One of Tulsa's earliest pioneers is O.W. Gurry, who had come from Arkansas to Oklahoma in 1889, Land Rush. It's important to note that Gurley is a first generation freedman. His mother and father were born into slavery and he would serve as the hope and the dream of the many enslaved. Just one generation from enslavement, one generation, his family and many others would move from enslavement to prosperity. When the Oklahoma Territory achieved statehood in 1907, segregationists led the, by white supremacists passed laws to criminalize many racial laws, including interracial marriage and prohibited blacks from obtaining high wage jobs. These injustices affirm O.W. Gurley's decision to establish a black centric community where black men and women were shielded from racial hostilities. It's important to note that Greenwood was initially established prior to Oklahoma becoming the state. So in a lot of sense, Greenwood is older than even the state of uh, Oklahoma. Hence there was an opportunity uh, on a level playing field for many of them. In the Black Star newspaper, the publisher A.J. Smitherman referred to O.W. Gurley as the king of little Africa. Therefore, it's appropriate to have this lecture here in Cincinnati's Little Africa. Yes, this area that you navigated parking for, <laughs> that you walked through, that the festival that's taking place, this area was originally Little Africa, a black community here in Cincinnati that thrived under racist legislation, but also had the capacity to be there for those freedom seekers that were crossing over the Ohio River in search of freedom. So this area was the gateway to freedom for countless number of freedom seekers on their way. So it's very, very fitting for us to have this lecture here. And so I know you didn't come here to hear me speak and so we're gonna to get to our special guest that we have here today. And that is Mr. Phil Keith Armstrong, who is a native of Ohio and has been in Tulsa for 20 plus years. He holds a bachelor's in mass communications from Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, a master's degree in public administration from the University of Akron, 
Phil has a very background working in the corporate sector and working as an entrepreneur in the restaurant business. In 2019, he was hired by the Tulsa Community Foundation as project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission to lead all coordination for fundraising, educational curriculum, economic development, and construction projects, namely the building project of the Greenwood Rising Black Wall Street History Center, who are our partners in this lecture here this evening. Phil has been actively engaged in the community by serving on several nonprofit boards, most notably Reading Partners of Tulsa, Tulsa Regional Chamber Board of Directors, Tulsa Opera, uh, Opera Board, Harvest Bank Board of Directors, and the past board chair of the Greenwood Cultural Center. In July of 2021, he transitioned into a new role as interim executive director of Greenwood Rising Black Wall Street History Center. He is, a lead, uh, he is a leadership Tulsa graduate, a Paul Harris Fellow with the Rotary Club of Tulsa, and a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. All right. A talented singer, <laughs> Phil enjoys singing for several events and organizations around Tulsa, most notably singing the Tulsa Regional Chamber Annual Meetings, Tulsa Drillers, and the Tulsa Symphony Orchestra Holiday Specials. Phil and his wife, Monique, resides in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they have a blended blessing of four beautiful children. Can you help me give a round of applause for Mr. Phil Armstrong? All right. Oops, you okay? You okay? All right. Good evening, everybody. I say again, good evening. It's a pleasure to be back home. This is home for me, as uh, Mr. Christopher Miller did point out. Um, and it is always uh, a wonderful opportunity to not only come home and see family and, and come back to where I received, uh, as they say, cut my teeth and grew up in a little small town, as I'll talk about here in a moment. But uh, it's a pleasure to come back and be able to be a contributing member of this history and to go around the country to talk about um, what has been um, encapsulating in my life in the last five uh, years and actually longer than that. Before I really get into that, uh, I want to thank and acknowledge uh, the board of directors for the Freedom Center, uh, the executive director, and also Christopher Miller, who actually traveled out to Tulsa about two months ago. Um, they returned the favor to us. Uh, when we were traveling around the United States and looking at uh, other institutions who were doing this work before we decided to uh, build and lay the foundation and start building Greenwood Rising, what it would look like. We went around the country to see who's already doing this. Of course, uh, the Lorraine Hotel um, and what that stands for. We went to even to um, New York and visited the 9-11 Museum. Um, the, our curator, and uh, who was chair of our education department at the time for the Centennial Commission, Hannibal B. Johnson, you'll hear more about him in the program, and myself, my sons, and my mother, we actually came here and spent an entire day um, looking at the, not only the physical structure, but how you laid out your exhibits, the story of the uh, Underground Railroad, and, and in just how you do your programming. So a lot of what we are doing now in our first year and then going into our second year is based off of some of the examples that we saw here. So um, please don't think this is just history here. Your thumbprint is on Greenwood because we got our ideas uh, from you. Our most prominent spot that we spent time in would be the Legacy Museum uh, and the National uh, Center for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, the incredibly um, uh, valiant work that Brian Stevenson is doing. Uh, if you haven't been there, uh, I strongly, strongly encourage you next to Greenwood Rising and next to uh, the Underground Railroad Freedom Center, before you um, um, leave this earth, uh, you ought to make that place your bucket list. It is the nickname is also known as uh, the lynching museum, uh, but the legacy museum is is incredibly, incredibly evocative, emotionally stirring, and it's educational, all wrapped up in the one. It is the legacy of um, 
African American people from slavery to mass incarceration. Um, and that was the museum that made us stand back and say, this is how you tell a story. How do you tell a story of tragedy, of triumph, and do it in such a way that people want to come from all over the world? Um, and so we, that's how we partnered up. You can see their logo on the left of the bottom screen, Local Projects. Local Projects was the lead design firm. Uh, they uh, actually designed the exhibits for the 9-11 Museum, um, and they've done museums all over the world, but one of their crown jewels uh, was uh, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery. And when we visited there and went back to Tulsa, there were so many elements of what they did there that we said we had to bring to Tulsa. So <clears throat> these institutions are connected. And we look at each other, we talk to each other, we do this work. So it's, it's, it's great to be able to, after our first year, to come back here uh, as one of our stomping grounds of where we got our inspiration to do what we're doing in Tulsa. So I just wanted to give kudos um, uh, while there and while we're here and to be able to provide that context. Also, uh, I'm not here by myself. I thank God that uh, I have my, my wife with me and uh, she is a native of Tulsa. She is, uh, I would say, a direct uh, descendant of what we call the Black Wall Street spirit because she grew up in that era in that area and her family and the lineage. Um, she actually attended and graduated Booker T. Washington High School, which is the historic school there that was in Greenwood, still there in the Greenwood history, but was the colored school that educated all the black children um, in the 1900s and even forward and even today. Um, so she graduated there. She went on uh, and went the HBCU track uh, and went to Langston University, HBCU in Langston, Oklahoma. Uh, you'll hear more about that in the program. And she went and got her master's from HBCU, Howard University. Um, and she is bad all by herself. And so I would like for my wife, Monique, to stand so you all can see her. I appreciate her being with me tonight. So my story and this story begins um, with a man by the name of William Stevens Pleasant. William Stevens Pleasant was my great, great grandfather. And he was born a slave. And in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, um, where there was a large contingent of Mississippi Choctaw and African Americans that intermingled and crossed each other in terms of bloodline lineage. He created with a full um, Choctaw, Mississippi, Indian woman, Native American woman, uh, my grandfather um, and great-grandfather and the lineage of my great-great-grandfather from Mississippi. He was the first pastor of a church that was built for freed slaves in Hazelhurst, Mississippi. And that's where my story begins in terms of understanding and knowing history. Uh, that passed on down to my mother. Um, he ended up having to move uh, to Bidwell, Ohio, um, and uh, where my mother was uh, born and raised, where I was born and raised. Bidwell, Ohio, in Gallia County, Ohio, is home to some of the most oldest black communities that are gone from us now, but all along the Ohio River, just like Cincinnati, if you could get across the Ohio River and when your feet touch the banks of Ohio, when West Virginia was still a slave state and was Virginia, you could escape and you could land on free ground. And I like to remind us in 2022, as my mother and grandfather would say, uh, remember from whence you've come and that this beautiful river that we see at one point in time before there were dams and it was so deep and wide, there were sections of the Ohio River that you could swim across and walk across and the thousands of African Americans that if they could just get to Ohio and then not just rest, but as we know, there were slavers that would come into Ohio to try to find freed slaves and take them back. And so you have these areas like Black Fork, Ohio, and Portsmouth, Ohio, and places like Bidwell, where black people would 
get way out in the woods, way out in the country and have communities and hide out. And there's a rich, vibrant history of black communities all over the state of Ohio. And you're just now starting to scratch the surface to that. That's my lineage. And actually tomorrow, I will be speaking at the annual emancipation celebration uh, in Gallipolis, Ohio. It is the longest running celebration of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States of America. They have been doing it consecutively since 1863. The 159th annual celebration in Gallipolis, Ohio, Saturday and Sunday, every third week in September. And so we were taught this as, I, as a kid and my mother instilled this in me. I went on and ended up getting a scholarship to ascend, attend Central State University. And as a sophomore in 1991, I knew nothing about Oklahoma other than what you would see on a map. And my college professor, Dr. Edwin Clay, in the spring of 1991, begins to teach his students about the amazing lives that black people were once able to live in the Oklahoma Territory that nobody knows about. That during the Reconstruction era and post-1863, post-1865, Indian country, the vernacular that would have been spoken is if you black and you can get to Oklahoma, you can live the life of a free man. A black man can own land legally like nowhere else in the United States at that time. A black man could own his own property, create his own industry, have businesses, have communities of people that look like him and be free from persecution from the South. How many of y'all heard that in your history books when you were going through school? When I was in Ohio grade school, all we knew and heard about in Oklahoma was the land run of 1889. But nobody talked about the historic black towns of 1883. So prominent and so efficient and growing so fast that in 1883, the United States government started having conversations about whether Oklahoma should be carved out as an all black state. How many of y'all heard that in your history books? <laughs> it's at this point when people come to the museum, especially in Oklahoma, that I'll say, and I dare you to go fact check me. <laughs> because it'll get you to sit down in front of your computer and get turn up a, 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 open a Google page and just type in Oklahoma, black towns, history, and any of that combination to hit enter. And page after page will come back about these black towns that were sprawling and vibrant in the Indian territory. And one of those lines will say, the success of the black towns in Oklahoma are at such a rate that the U.S. government is considering carving out Oklahoma as an all black state. That's this history that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to go through this and give you a full synopsis of this history. It's not just about the massacre. Last year, the whole world leaned in and saw how a community can take its tragic past and decide to do something with it. Acknowledge it, number one, atone for it, but then how do we reconcile and try to do something to commemorate and remember this history and move it forward? And not just focus on the tragedy of 1921, but talk about the glory of black towns and black achievement prior to and then after the massacre. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. And so I want you to get your questions ready and get your comments ready because I love some Q&A at the end of this and I hope you are inspired to have some time tonight to talk. September the 19th, 2020, it was a Sunday night. I had just really got into the full gauged work of being the project director of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. And everyone on a Sunday night that had a HBO subscription uh, sitting in front of their TV pre-pandemic uh, around the world were tuning in to watch what the latest 
Hollywood rendition of a comic book and comic book characters turn into a Hollywood movie. They were ready to see what HBO was going to do with Watchmen. Very few people understood that Watchmen was a comic book that was really popular in the mid 80s, 1980s, and it focused on characters that had superpowers that could go back into history to correct and address wrongs and try to repair the damage that had been done in some of the most horrific and darkened moments of history. So what was HBO Watchmen going to do with this history? And people all over the world watched and the first three minutes and 35 seconds of a sequence shocked the world and elevated our history of what we were already doing for about three or four years into the process and it really blew the lid off of what in the world happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma back in 1921. And that's how we'll start our program tonight. Again, that sequence was the opening of 
HBO's Watchmen. No one had any idea what they were going to see that night until they saw that first moment. Um, that was September uh, the 20th, 2019, September 21st. Uh, and for the next three or four weeks after that, myself and several members of the commission, every single day I was fielding phone call after phone call, interview after interview, and it was news, media, publications, organizations all over the country. And it ran the gamut from CNN to MSNBC to Fox News to New York Times to Forbes magazine to the BBC. And it was interview after interview, and they would all say the same things. HBO Watchmen saw that the other night, powerful, wow. Can you talk to us about the opening sequence? Can you let us know how much of that was Hollywood hype um, you know, like the planes flying over and all that stuff. What, what was real and what was not? Because it was just so, wow, powerful. Um, and they all would start out that way. And so then I would spend the next about 10 minutes to describe to them everything you saw in that opening sequence was probably the most real depiction, a visual depiction of eyewitness accounts that and testimony, witness statements that are held to this day at the Oklahoma Historical Society of everything that happened from May 31st, 1921, all the way until violence uh, was quelled by the, um, by the marshals uh, in June the 1st, the following day of 1921. And planes flying over, bullets dropping incendiary devices and burning homes to the ground, the shooting, um, Everything that you saw was the most real depiction of what it must have been like in that moment. So then the second question, okay, if all this really happened as you say, how come nobody knows about it? And then it would be, that's why we're doing the work that we're doing. And we've been doing it since 2015. You all just now showed up. Um, this HBO watching was uh, and of course, other ones came out, Lovecraft, but HBO Watchmen was the first to really take the history and really say, we're going to show people what it must have looked like and what it must have been like. And that's where that came out. There's a lot of uh, homages they do, uh, just uh, a, a honor of the history that people were not aware of. And I'll address those real quickly. The opening um, black and white uh, silence film uh, was an homage to Bass Reeves. And many people were awakened to the fact that Bass Reeves uh, was the most successful U.S. Deputy Marshal that ever lived, a black man that patrolled the Oklahoma and Arkansas Territory from the 1880s all the way up to his death in 1913. He's buried in Muskogee, Oklahoma. There is a huge 20-foot tall statue to him, dedicated to him, that's in Arkansas, where he came from. He could speak fluent uh, Muscogee Creek, uh, Seminole, and Cherokee, which made him so um, such a, a great um, um, adjudicator, if you will, of justice as a deputy marshal in the territories of Oklahoma and Arkansas. He brought over 3,000 felons to justice, and all of that time he only had to shoot 16, kill 16 in, in defense. And he was known for being really crafty. He would dress up in disguises and infiltrate gangs to get after the person he's looking for and disguise himself. Bass Reeves is the real life account of what some of us, we're about to show our age, some of us grew up watching The Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger is a fictional character based on the real life of a black US Deputy Marshal named Bass Reeves, hence the black mask that he wore on his face. And if you don't believe me, they actually have a museum outside of Missouri, the Bass Reeves Museum, to tell his story, the true story of Bass Reeves, the real Lone Ranger. Then you have the theater, the little boys playing and the mothers playing the piano. The theater represents the Dreamland Theater that was in Greenwood, Black Wall Street. 
It was the most prominent theater in the territory of Oklahoma. And then when it became a state still was uh, integrated, black people and white citizens would cross the railroad tracks and come and spend their money and come in Greenwood and come to the Dreamland Theater. Uh, it was known for having the only theater with air conditioning, whatever air conditioning was back then. Uh, but it was a five star theater owned by Lula Williams, a black female who owned a candy store, who owned apartment buildings and owned the Dreamland Theater. It was destroyed in 1921 and obviously never uh, rebuilt again. Uh, but this rich history, I like to point out things that people would not recognize unless you uh, know that story. Tulsa's historic Greenwood District reflects the power of the human spirit generally, the vision, determination, and the key word throughout all of this history is the resilience the resilience of its oppressed and marginalized black citizens specifically. Um, the history of Greenwood is really told uh, many, many books, many, many books are out there, but the key book that I suggest to people if you really wanna know about this history uh, is this book by Hannibal B. Johnson. Um, it was on the best time, I think of the best seller list, once again, for um, nonfiction in 2021, but he wrote the book actually 20 years ago. And he actually serves on the founding board of directors of Greenwood Rising. Uh, he is the world's foremost authority on all history about Greenwood and the Oklahoma Territory and black towns. Um, and he wrote this book, From Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District, Hannibal B. Johnson. In this book, to really reflect the resilience of the people. There is a letter of correspondence between two men, Oliver and Curtis, that took place the days after the massacre. And he received permission from the families to actually print that letter in the book. And I like to read that and have that here. I will read it to you. You can follow along silently there in the second paragraph. Dear Oliver, I am by our local newspaper fully advised of the whole terrible tragedy there. Now that they have destroyed your homes, wrecked your schools, churches, and business places, and killed your people, I am sure that the Negroes will rapidly give up the town and move north. Enclosed, please find draft for $40 to purchase your ticket to Detroit. We'll be expecting you. Curtis. Key note here, the reason they were so confident they would move is because, uh, we'll talk about it later, the summer of 1919. 1919 was a mass breakout of violence, uh, mob violence against black towns all over America in a six month period of time. It's called the Red Summer of 1919. And several, over a dozen black communities were just destroyed because of the racial animosity and violence that occurred against those communities. Philadelphia, New York City, Baltimore, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Longview, Texas, Elaine, Arkansas, and they all happened in a short span of time. They would wipe them out, burn them out, destroy them, and the blacks would leave, which was they wanted, and they'd move north. So that was the backdrop, and that's why he was so confident. I'm not sure you're probably gonna do the same thing. They're gonna give up the town. Here's 40 bucks so you can get out of there. This was Curtis, this was uh, Oliver's response. Dear Curtis, how kind of you to volunteer your sympathetic assistance. It is just like you to be helpful to others in time of stress like this. True it is, we are facing a terrible situation. It is equally true that they have destroyed our homes, they have wrecked our schools, they have reduced our churches to ashes, and they have murdered our people, Curtis. But they have not touched our spirit. And while I speak only for myself, let it be said that I came here and built my fortune with that spirit. I shall reconstruct it here with that spirit, and I expect to live on and die here with it. Oliver. When we talk about the Black Wall Street spirit, that's the spirit of Greenwood. Here's Greenwood. What did it look like? Um, back in 1920, it was called Negro Tulsa. Um, it's where you could live if you were a black person in the 1920s. About 10 to 12,000 African Americans by the 1920s were living here. Doctors, lawyers, businesses, Everything that you needed was on the north side of the railroad tracks, and this was that part of the town that was called Greenwood. 
the black towns of Oklahoma, as you can see here, East uh, Oklahoma, this is from the Oklahoma Historical Society. By the 1940s, by the mid-1940s, there were over 50 incorporated all black towns. And I quantify all black. The properties, the businesses, that back in then they called them the haberdasheries, uh, the homes, it was all farmland. Most of them were farmers but they had communities of black people living and prospering. And you can see them all there. Um, and you can see the ones that are still incorporated and, and existing still today. You see Langston there um, and Bowley, Oklahoma. Um, before there was a Greenwood, the richest community of black people in the 1880s, before Greenwood and anywhere else, black, Bowley, Oklahoma had the richest black citizens that lived in one community in the United States of America. They had a black owned bank in the late 1880s and 1890s, Bowley, Oklahoma. And all the way up into the 1960s, 70s and 80s, it was the home of the world's largest all black rodeo, Bowley, Oklahoma. And Dr. Edwin Clay, who I mentioned earlier that taught us about and spent a whole semester talking about Oklahoma territory and black people. He showed us a, a, showed us a video a documentary back in the 1991, I believe, uh, when it first came out, going back to T-Town. He was actually a filmmaker himself. And so he had some uh, some of the ability to be a part of that. But it was going back to T-Town and it talked about Bowley, Oklahoma. But Langston there, um, I mentioned earlier about the 1880s and 1883 the father of the black town movement, I don't have him here, a picture of him, um, but Edwin P. McCabe, E.P. McCabe. He was a black land settler, a black attorney. He would come into Oklahoma from Arkansas and he was considered the father of the Oklahoma black town movement. And he literally was like a cheerleader. He would actually come into these towns and help black folks actually know you can do this. And the vernacular that would have been spoken then in the 1860s, 70s, 80s is let's show the white man what we can do. We've been given land, we've been given opportunity. We can be productive, we can be professional, we can take care of ourselves, we can create our own economies. And so he is considered the father of the black time that got all these black citizens to take their land and their communities and be prosperous and productive with it. He actually purchased the land that we know of today as Langston, Oklahoma, that gave the way to historically black colleges, Langston, Oklahoma, uh, Langston University. And I tell people, people sometimes wonder, why is this historic black school out in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma? Kind of the same way when people go to Central State University or Wilberforce, Ohio, what's this black school doing in the middle of cornfields? Um, it was the only place that black people can go and get higher education. And Edwin P. McCabe was the father of that. Greenwood, people just really don't have an understanding of the concept and the size and how big uh, uh, Greenwood itself was. If, you, if I can get my cursor here. So right here, here's the railroad tracks uh, going along here. And everything north of the railroad tracks was uh, just like in the south. You knew you were on the black side of town when you crossed the railroad tracks. Everything south was white Tulsa or downtown Tulsa. Everything across the railroad tracks was black Tulsa, Negro Tulsa. Where Greenwood Rising is, is right on this corner. The picture I showed you that said 1920s Negro Tulsa was this corner here, Greenwood and Archer, the gateway to Black Wall Street, where all the businesses, where all the economy was. This is where everybody did their shopping, their businesses, and where they came together. So all of this area, 33 to 35 city blocks. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. 33 to 35 city blocks of black homes, black businesses, the community of Greenwood, 10 to 12,000 African Americans living and prospering in their own community. That was Greenwood. And so I'm gonna move forward and go in and out in some of the scenes and backdrops. So the, how did this place, this prominent place, this wonderful place that O.W. Gurley purchased the first bit of land north of the railroad tracks in 1906, the first recorded 
recording of a black man buying some land and opening a business. He's called the father of Black Wall Street, O.W. Gurley, Ottawa Gurley. And that was 1905, I'm sorry, 1906. Oklahoma didn't reach statehood till 1907. But in 1905, the term that we call Black Wall Street wasn't even referring to Greenwood, wasn't even referring to the Greenwood community that we say this is where Black Wall Street is. The term Black Wall Street was, was coined by Booker T. Washington and when he visited Oklahoma in 1905, just like many people, and the, and, the, and the fame of what Oklahoma was for black people was getting out everywhere. By the 1880s, 1890s, all these black towns had some sort of newspaper, a uh, pamphlet, some type of story, news, and they would send pamphlets across the country to other black communities. It was called black boosterism. They actually boosted Black people moving to Oklahoma. You got to move to Oklahoma. We got it made here. We're living great lives here. We're free here. We can own land here. You got to come to Oklahoma. That's literally what they were doing. It was called black boosterism. And it reached communities all over the country. That was the reason for the second sprawling of black citizens coming into Oklahoma. And I hope somebody asks me a question during Q&A, how did black people get to Oklahoma in the first place? So that's hint, hint, I'm hoping somebody asked that question. Uh, but they come as a result of the boosterism and Booker T. Washington says, I wanna go see this for myself. So he spends about two to three weeks and he travels to Oklahoma. And when he gets there, they take him from town to town to up Mulgee and Muskogee and Taft and Redbud and Boley and Tallahassee and Langston, on and on. And during his trip one day, after going from town to town and seeing everything in the town as black folks, I've never seen a place like this where everywhere I go, black people are owning things and doing their own stuff. And it is said that he stood and said, this is like living in Negro Wall Street. He's the first to coin that phrase, 1905. The 1960s, 1970s, we changed the phrase uh, to Black Wall Street, but he wasn't even referring to what we see today as Greenwood. He was referring to the Oklahoma Territory and the prospering black communities was to him like living in Negro Wall Street. So that's where that comes from. So what happened? How can the same place where black people are living free also become the exact same place where the most horrific outbreak of racial violence against a community in American soil take place? And there is what we call the arc of oppression. A white mob didn't just wake up on May 31st and say, we're gonna go kill black people. There is a timeline that we follow and track in history as racial animosity, jealousy, just begins to grow and amorous against black citizens achieving one generation out of slavery. You got black people that are making $500 a day you got citizens and people who are attuned to the growth of the Ku Klux Klan. Remember in 1915, we have the release of Birth of a Nation. And that's when you first historically hear words and phrases like, we need to take our country back. Anybody heard that in the last couple of years? It's nothing new. These are not new phrases. These are phrases that have been spoken by these groups all the way back then started in 1915. In fact, for, and this is not a political discussion, this is all about history. So please don't go to left or right or, or independent. Let's just talk about history. The phrase, make America great again, was first spoken in the, the mid 1900s because the th concept was if we let black people continue to have this country, it's gonna take us down. And we've got to make sure we keep this country pure for those that believe that and great. This is nothing new. The increase in resistance to black achievement goes in cycles and waves. Reconstruction era, the Ku Klux Klan, stood on the south side of the railroad tracks of Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
and they can look across the railroad tracks, downtown prospering, bustling Tulsa. They call it the, the new Emerald City. All this oil money, and we're building these beautiful Art Deco buildings. And right across the railroad tracks, we see black folks driving nice cars. You see black folks living in that nicer homes than some of us, dressing up in suits every day, spending money, and it created for some this anger, this jealousy, and it just started fueling the mindset. And what brought black citizens came here to escape the South, to escape Jim Crow, to escape the Ku Klux Klan, to escape lynchings and come to this free territory where I can live free. So what happened? The land run of 1889. The land run of 1889 just basically says, in summary, you know what? Black folks, white folks, and Indians in Oklahoma are really getting rich off of this oil. You own land, you got oil in that land, and everybody was getting rich. There was an article published by the Philadelphian in 1913. The article is titled, The Negro and the Oil. The first paragraph, the first sentence is, black men, white men, and Indians are being made into millionaires overnight these days in Oklahoma. That was 1913. 1989, the government says, you shouldn't be the only one getting this. We're gonna let everybody come in here, land run. Who responded? Thousands of segregationists from the South. So imagine their shock to travel and come to an area and they see black people owning their land. and Black people living, they think they're living equal with the white man. This was something that they were not attuned to. And so the first thing that happens is it starts making its ways into the law, into, wake its way into the laws of the land. And once you get it ingested in the laws, you can disenfranchise individuals. 1907, Oklahoma becomes a state, achieves statehood. The first act, the first law that was put in, act, in action in the state of Oklahoma, December the 8th, 1907, Jim Crow. You can go all the way back and you say the first law that's put on the books, we're now a state. What's the first law that we should incorporate? Jim Crow. Now imagine the slap in the face that was for black folks who've been living in Oklahoma territory, in and in territory, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and now we're a state. And legally, I can't go certain places now. Legally, I can't do certain things. Legally, if I can't prove that I have this land in my name and passed down to me, that land can be taken away from me. If I can't read, I can't vote. If you can't vote, then you can't pay taxes. If you can't pay taxes and vote, then we're gonna take this land from you. And so it starts ingesting its ways into the laws of the land. That's where it begins. And there's a timeline that we show in, in Greenwood Rising Museum um, a timeline that this racial animosity, we call it the down spiral of the Oklahoma Territory, starts going down this racial animosity in this scope. And it just grows and it just grows. I'm going to call out a few dates. We jump to 1911. There is a picture in uh, a space here uh, of the Ark of Oppression. Um, and um, I think it might be off to the side there. There's a picture of the lynching of Laura Nelson and her son. It is one of the most copied photographs uh, on the history of lynching across college campuses in the United States. I don't have it shown here because of the graphic nature. I never know when there are certain uh, age uh, children in the audience, um, but it is shown there in that space and it's Laura Nelson and her 14 year old son LD and they're lynched and many people who've seen that photograph and it's been used many, many times have no idea that that was taken May 25th, 1911 in Okima, Oklahoma. So as Greenwood is prospering and growing in this section in that town of Tulsa, the growth of the resistance to that is growing in Oklahoma as well. You jump to 1919 where we talked about that, the summer of 1919. Um, what was happening in 1919 is that many soldiers, black and white, were returning from World War I. And we always talk about the economy and the, the day that the market crashed in 1929, 
But there's also was a huge economic downturn in the United States in 1919. And so you have soldiers coming back. And by the way, Greenwood was not the only black community that was prospering. I already told you. Because of Jim Crow and segregation, black communities became insular, insular, insular economies. The side effect, if you will, uh, the consequence of Jim Crow, since a black person could not go downtown and get a bank loan, they couldn't go and do their shopping downtown, they had to create their own economies and take care of each other. The one of the greatest things that created black wealth was Jim Crow. <laughs> because we had to take care of each other if you were black. And so you would work outside the community, hard labor or a domestic labor, but you would spend your money back in your community. And because Greenwood was had such wealth because of land ownership and oil, that dollar circulated over and over and over in Greenwood. But there were many communities like that around the country because of that instance of becoming communities that had to take care of themselves. But Soldiers are returning back in 1919, and some white soldiers, they couldn't find a job. They were losing their homes. They couldn't take care of their families. They're living destitute, but they can look across the railroad tracks, and they can see black folks living just fine, still got their houses, still feeding their children, still living just fine, and it created this anger. This shouldn't be. I should be living better than them. I was raised to believe that they're underneath me. And it created that anger. And it built and it built and it built all over this country that led to 1919. So you get to 1921. And after all this violence is breaking around in the United States, the crown jewel of black achievement is Greenwood. Greenwood of Oklahoma. And the resistance and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in Oklahoma, we actually show this uh, when you're in this space, if you go to the, to the right when you're in this space, there will actually have in the case one page, it's, in, it's behind a case book, but it's one page of an entire book. That book is the membership of the Ku Klux Klan of Tulsa County of 1919 to 1929. And it is the who's who of Tulsa County. And we just have one page of it. it. has their name and their occupation. And those occupations, when you go through it, mayor, Tulsa, chamber, banker, lawyer, doctor, police officer, businessman. It was almost as if being a member of the Klan uh, in the 1920s in Tulsa was like being a member of the Rotary Club. It was just a status symbol. If you were in a position of leadership, you were a member of the Klan. No other state had an increase in the membership of the Ku Klux Klan as the state of, the, of Oklahoma. From 19 to 1929, the largest growth in the membership of the Klan occurred in Oklahoma. So you have these two factions growing, this black achievement and this resistance to black achievement. And by 1921, Hannibal Johnson, the historian, describes the times and the racial climate in Tulsa like a powder keg of racial animosity and all it needed was a striking of the match to set it ablaze. And so that striking of the match is what we refer to the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre when a young boy is accused in the Drexel building, falsely accused of attacking a white girl. This is the Drexel building. The Drexel building in Tulsa was the only building that had colored restrooms for black people who worked downtown. He was a shoe shine boy. If you were a domestic worker, there was only one place downtown, third floor of the Drexel building is where the black people would go use the restroom. He was a shoe shine boy. He went to use the restroom. He went to the third floor. And when he got back on the elevator, something happened where the elevator shifted. It did something where he lost his balance to catch himself from falling over, he reaches out and suddenly grabs the arm of Sarah Page. Sarah Page was a 17-year-old white girl who she was uh, employed as the elevator operator. He was a 19-year-old black boy. She screams, 
The elevator rests on the first floor. The doors open up. He takes off running. Why would he run if he didn't do anything? Because he's a black man on the elevator of Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, in the middle of the day. And this white girl screams. He took off running. The scream was heard by a merchant in the Renberg's grocery store. He comes across the street. And what he witnesses is this distraught young white girl in the elevator. And when he gets there, he sees a black man running away. Out of that situation, the Tulsa Tribune prints this front page paper on May 30th, 1921. Nab Negro for attacking girl in an elevator. I'm not making a mistake there. This happened on May 30th. This was printed uh, at 3.15 p.m., on May 31st. Remember, the massacre started May 31st. So let me, I know it's kind of hard to read, but um, the uh, cursor here, this second paragraph, uh, or this paragraph here, and this fourth paragraph, I'm going to read those out to you. It says here, um, a few minutes later, he, being Dick Rowland, entered the elevator, she claimed, and attacked her, scratching her hands and face and tearing her clothes. Her screams brought a clerk from the Renberg store to her assistance and the Negro fled. And then at the bottom of the paragraph it says, tenants of the Drexel building said the girl is an orphan who works as an elevator operator to pay her way through business college. Everything that I just read to you was false. We know it was false because the Tulsa Police Department, after the days after the massacre, interviewed Sarah Page. They wanted to press charges. They, wanted, they had to justify the destruction and what took place. She would not cooperate anything that was written. Yes, I did scream. Yes, he did not scratch my face. He did not tear my clothes. This article was made to present as if he tried to rape this girl in the elevator. The last paragraph, tenants of the drugs builder, she's an orphan who's working away uh, through business school. She was living with her parents. She was not going to business school. You understand yellow journalism. If anybody have ever been in a journalism major, you would know the history in the early 1900s, there was something called yellow journalism. Yellow journalism, kind of like what we see kind of today when you watch cable news. Who can tell the most salacious story? What can you add to it to put your extra thoughts on it or how you feel? So you take the news and you add some color to it. This is nothing new, what we hear and see on cable news today. It started out as yellow journalism. So who can create a story around the news to get people to buy your paper? Yellow journalism. And this is what they did. And they described this in such a way that the dog whistle, the dog whistle for those who were in the Klan, who opened up their front page paper was this. A black man has tried to rape an innocent white girl on an elevator, downtown Tulsa in broad daylight. What are you gonna do about it? That's the dog whistle. That was printed at 3.15 p.m. on May 31st. Dick Rowland had already been arrested. They arrested him on the accusation he was in the jail. By 4 p.m., a mob begins to form around the courthouse. By 9 p.m., the mob has grown to about 400, 500. What escalates it further is black people in Greenwood hear that there's going to be a lynching, and they're going to try to lynch that black boy, Dick Rowland. And the black men who served in World War I, who were unafraid, still had their guns, disciplined, said this is not going to happen on our watch. About three dozen of them gathered together and marched downtown. About 9.30 p.m., and it's dark, May 31st, and that enraged the crowd, those who were fueled by the Ku Klux Klan. Number one, you're not even supposed to be on this side of town. Number two, who do you think you are come marching down here with guns in your hand? What you going to do with them guns? This is the mindset that's going on, and it, was, it stoked the fire. And they came down, stood in front of the courthouse with their guns. They wanted him to get his due justice. He's not getting lynched today. We've seen what's happened in other communities in 1919. This is, uh, this is not going to happen in Tulsa today. We're going to protect him. 
The call goes out to white citizens. Black folks done gone crazy. They came down here with guns and the call went out. Get your guns and come on down to Tulsa. The crowd of the mob grows to about a thousand, almost fifteen hundred. By 10.30 p.m., the emotions of the crowds get to a fevered pitch. One of the members of the mob, a white man, his last name was McQueen, decides to go up and try to take the gun away from one of the black men. His name was Johnny Cole. They wrestle and fight over the gun. And during that struggle to see who's going to get the gun, the gun discharges. That shot uh, approximately went off at 10.30 p.m., and at that moment, more than one eyewitness account says at that moment, quote, all hell broke loose. The fighting, the shooting, the killing begins there. The black men retreat to Greenwood. The call goes out to even more white citizens. Black folks done gone crazy. They're killing white folks. And that's all they needed to say. About the mob increases to about 1,500 to 2,000 from about 1030 to about one in the morning. At that moment, this is all what I'm giving you is not philosophy, philosophy. Um, this is actually recorded history that's held at the Oklahoma Historical Society. And I have to say that for those who think the next part that I'm going to say is just something made up. Over the next hour and a half, the Tulsa Police Department then deputizes the members of the mob. They're given guns, they're given ammunition, and they are deputized to go into Greenwood. They gather together, and at 1 a.m. in the morning, June 1, they march into Greenwood full of fury, rage, and anger, and they begin 18 to 20 hours of shooting on sight. Any black person that would step out their house, burning, looting, destroying an entire community that we refer to today as Greenwood. And by the next morning, um, the um, Oklahoma Guard, National Guard, was called in to quell the violence. That was at 11.21 a.m. the next morning. But by that time, Greenwood was basically burned to the ground. The planes were private planes because black citizens were fighting. They were fighting back. White citizens lost their lives as well. But what really turned the tide is when you are surrounded and capped off, you're only going to have so much ammunition to fight back. And when they get in their private planes and start flying over and dropping keros what they call kerosene bombs and, sitting back and dropping them on the rooftops and then throwing torches on the rooftops and that kerosene oil would burn from the top. That's why when you look at it, it looks like a, a Hiroshima where you just dropped a bomb. Every structure burned from the rooftop down. The police department gathers around. The fire department is around, but they don't go in to tip out the fires. All they are told is keep the fires from crossing over into the white neighborhood, but let it burn to the ground. And they stopped black folks from trying to get to escape. It was a horrific, horrific 18 to 20 hours. That is the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. But the story doesn't end there. Time did not stand still. The real story of resilience is the fact that these black folks had a mindset of we shall not be moved. That's why Curtis said, I'm sending you 40 bucks. I know you want to give up the town. And black folks in green said, no, we ain't moving. About 4,000 escaped for their lives, never to return to Greenwood ever again. The 6,000 approximately that remained immediately by November of 1921, the Tulsa world has reports of black citizens beginning to rebuild their homes. And that is all without them being able to get any money from the city, from those who were perpetrated the violence. They could not file, they filed their insurance claims, but because it was labeled a riot, this was blamed on the black community. It was called a Negro uprising, a riot. That's why we don't call it the 1921 Tulsa race riot anymore. Because it was labeled a riot, it further perpetuated the harm because then the insurance companies said in their fine print, we don't pay out for riots. A riot means you did this to yourself. You burned your community down. So none of these people were able to this day file and receive any 
financial remuneration for life insurance policies, business insurance policies, because it was labeled a riot. Fast forward to summer of 2020. Um, if there's anything that we learned from the summer of George Floyd and the riots that broke out and even the different periods of time in American history when uh, Martin Luther King said the voice of the unheard is the riot, a riot, and, and here's the, the leading of why we changed the name, why the community said we're no longer going to refer to this as the riot. Um, a riot is when people rise up in their own community out of frustration, out of anger, and they burn and destroy their own businesses and places in their community. Whether we like it or not, that's what a riot is. This was not a riot. An entirely different community came in and invaded another community and destroyed it and then went back home. There are a number of ghastly descriptors. We're talking about nomenclature, what you name something. This could have been named many different things. You could have named it a disaster. Because of the fire that was used, you could have named it a holocaust. Because of the fact that they sent postcards around the country bragging about what they did, pictures of the flames and the destruction, and they hand wrote on the postcard saying, running the Negro out of Tulsa. June 1, 1921, and sent it all over the country. Because they were trying to run the Negro out of Tulsa, um, you can describe this as an ethnic cleansing or a massacre. But one thing you should never have called it was a riot. And so reparations is not always just about who's going to get a, a check for what they're due. Reparations is this, repairing past damages and making amends. So Tulsa got together and said, we're going to repair this. This is something easy. We're going to stop calling this a riot because it wasn't a riot. And that's why the big name change, 1921 Tulsa race massacre. But they rebuilt their community. By the 1940s, Greenwood gets its, its second stride. In fact, it reaches its economic apex by 1943. When you hear about Black Wall Street and the businesses, over 1,200 black-owned homes, over 200 black-owned businesses, three major black-owned hospitals, seven major grocery stores, theaters, libraries. The list goes on and on. That's actually, that period is after the massacre destruction. It is incredible. I don't care your background, your politics, what color you are. That is an incredible story of resilience, the indomitable human spirit. We're going to rebuild our community and we're going to do it on our own. Who would want to stay in a place like that? But they did. That is why we talk about the Greenwood spirit. So it was actually double the size. Economically, Greenwood doubled after the massacre than before the massacre. And so this space, basically coming to the end of my presentation is, what do we do with this history today? Number one, we don't just wallow in the, the horror of 1921. We talk about what we've talked about tonight, how incredible the Oklahoma Territory was. This is American history, incredible black history, American history that we talk about, need to teach more. We talk about the destruction, we talk about Greenwood, but we talk about how they rebuilt their community and brought it back. And then we talk about the second destruction. Well, what happened? What happens when you build a highway right through the middle of the heart of a black community? The interstate highway programs of the 1960s, the use of eminent domain to destroy black communities. Eminent domain hasn't always been used for these purposes, but we know without a doubt, um, it just wasn't coincidence, that from 1967 all the way to 1977, 1978, everywhere the interstate highway went through large urban areas, isn't it interesting how it always went through the black community? So it wasn't by mistake, it was a design. And when you look at where the highway goes, just like the million dollar mile in Columbus, Ohio, I-70 ripped right through the middle of the prosperous black community that existed in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in Columbus. And that's what happened to Greenwood. What happens when you build a highway and all the businesses and the homes that are moved and 
torn away because of eminent domain right through the heart of the black community. It destroyed it a second time. And it was worse than the first because at least after the first time, you still had your land. This time, you destroyed it and we take your land. So almost guarantee you aren't going to build it back. It was the more devastating what they did in 1967 than what was done in 1921 because we couldn't take the land back. So what do we do now? We take this history and we use it as a backdrop to talk about the things that we're still dealing with now, the political divisiveness in our country, the racial divisiveness in some pockets of America. How do we use the backdrop of what happened in 1921 so that we learn from history and don't repeat history? How do we get people in a safe space to have hard, courageous conversations, things that we may disagree on, but at least we're in a space to talk about different perspectives and listen to each other so that we don't get to a point where we allow false narratives and somebody saying something and people repeating it and people believing it and people get hyped up and people all of a sudden break out. Does that sound familiar? Again, not talking about politics, just talking about the nature of human nature. January 6th, I received more phone calls and emails from historians that simply said, oh my gosh, we are watching what probably took place 100 years ago in 1921. When you unleash rage based on false narratives, and people believing a false narrative and get to a point, if we don't do something, you're going to, you got to do something. We got to get these, they're trying to kill us. Let's go over there. That's what happened in 1921. And they, ah, that's what we saw on January 6th. What Greenwood Rising says is, hey, America, we've been here before. We have seen this before. And if we don't do something about getting people in a room to talk through things, we are going to repeat history. And so now we have, in October, we will have field trip programs. They are teaching this in Oklahoma, but Tulsa Public Schools actually is making a requirement. Every eighth grade student that comes through Tulsa Public School has to come through Greenwood Rising to learn this history. The Tulsa Police Department, as of August, makes it a requirement you can't be a Tulsa Police Department. It's now part of their curriculum until you, the new re recruiting class, comes through Greenwood Rising and learns this history. That's repairing the past damage. That's a part of, a part of reparations, getting people to remember this history and how to apply it in your own daily lives. It's uncomfortable, but uncomfortable history does not mean we shouldn't talk about it. And in the words of Hannibal Johnson, um, if you're able to teach about what white supremacy did in 1921, or what white supremacy did with uh, Adolf Hitler and the Jewish Holocaust. If you can do it and teach it and somebody's not comfortable, you're not teaching it correctly. It's not supposed to be comfortable. <laughs> in fact, if you can listen to this and be comfortable, that is scary. It is supposed to make us wake up and say, man's inhumanity to man, we do not want to go back there again. And the only way you do that is you talk about it and you teach the history. Because a group of people, as Martin Luther King said, who forget their history are destined to repeat it. I'm going to show you a couple of videos. This is a little teaser, I call it, not for if you come to Greenman Rising and travel to Tulsa, Oklahoma, but when you decide one day to come, um, this is a little bit of what you may see. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And so I rise, I rise, I rise. You are living in it now, Jerome. This is our promised land. We could buy us a seat at the table. <laughs> 
That's what you think. Mm -hmm. Won't be long now. People are just people. But left unchecked, those people could be a dangerous mob. Let the church say amen. <laughs> house on fire. Please, don't set my house on fire. Of course, that is exactly what they did. Again, just a little teaser, um, and these next three are just quick 30-second videos of testimonials. The day we dedicated the building, June the 2nd of 2021, as part of the commemorative activities, we set up a camera, and we did about 20 different testimonials, and I'll just have three of them here. But literally, it was the first moment that people walked through, and we just asked them, you know, what's your thoughts? What do you think uh, as, you, as they went through? And here are three of them I'd like to show. I personally became pretty involved with the video of the four part uh, showing the fire and people talking about their experiences of people setting fire to their houses, escaping. I didn't realize there were, I mean, I might have heard, but the airplanes were dropping bullets or bombs or something on them. But that was very, uh, very real. It was like being part of the horror of it. Yeah. And this uh, barbershop was very well done. Uh, hearing the barbers talk about the American dream and how everything was going to be good, and you know, and it it, it didn't happen, and it um, that was that was hard. I think I've I think I've said it all. I think I've spoke from the space of my heart and the gratefulness to all the ones that contributed to this space and what it's going to bring to not just this community here, but other communities and other spaces. And the young children can come and they can learn and they can know all children of all colors, all backgrounds, all races. There's only one race, it's the human race. And if we come here and we come together, then we will all be great. That's it, that's all. This space. I will say this. Being a, a, a native of Tulsa, if you haven't been to the, the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. for an African American, in any American, but especially for an African American, it is a must. This, to me, in my personal opinion, is the second most important museum in the history of the United States when it comes to African American history, period. I like to end on that one. Um, I thank you all for your time. I know it'll be a little bit long, but I'm, gonna, I'm glad that you 
took the time to come out and hear this information and this history. And um, I, I just uh, there's a mic here that they've set up, um, maybe 10 minutes. There's also a mic over here to the right. I uh, would love to anybody have a comment or a quick question or just anything, uh, dialogue or anything that you might have that you, you want to uh, ask me right quick while you have me. Yeah, you said I teed up the first question. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Um, labels are important, I think, and especially with dealing with African American history. I was waiting for you to say the two magic words, but you held out and then you finally said them, ethnic cleansing. Why can't we call what happened in the Nadir through the 40s ethnic cleansing? I served in the military. I was in the Balkans. I saw what it looks like. No different here. So why can't we use those international terms to get some type of liability, maybe some consequences? Yeah, it actually, it's um, a very um, uh, excellent, excellent uh, question and also excellent statement. Uh, those are discussions that actually are uh, quite literally are taking place uh, in the country as it relates to, uh, for for example, certain communities that are adorned. Um, reparations and reparative work in different communities around the country. The, 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 the progression of having these discussions is happening. Um, having an official branding of that, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm open to that. Uh, getting everyone to be on the same consensus is that's what we'll call it. That's, of course, the challenge. The fact that people are even recognizing what ethnic cleansing means and the different apparatus that were utilized, knowing or unknowing, and what it did and the effect of them. It's just, for example, uh, when we talk, when we, when now that we look back on uh, integration, you know, uh, I'm an integrationist. I went to school with black children, and white children. I'm glad that I did. But one of the most destructive things that happened to black communities went to, was integration. Um, black citizens now have the freedom to leave their communities and spend their money outside the community. And it gave them a sense of empowerment. Uh, we look back on it and say, you know, you know, you, you, you took money out of the out of your black community and businesses failed because you no longer lived and shopped in that community. But when you're looking back on history, it's looking back on history. What would you do when you are given the opportunity to say, I now can walk in this business where it was illegal? from my mama, my daddy, my grandfather, and now I can buy something here and you have to sell it to me. I'm gonna come back tomorrow and I'm gonna buy something else. You know, that was that sense of empowerment. We can now go other places and not just be confined to our community. And it was powerful, but the 30, 40, 50, 60 years afterwards is what it did to the community. And I think that's where we are now. What, how do we review things that we have covered up under politics or covered up and just not t saying that was a, a, a frame of ethnic cleansing. I think those conversations happen. When you look at Illinois and what they did for uh, the citizens there, the $25,000 that goes towards them being able to buy their homes and, and home equity for their homes, uh, what's going on in, in, on the West Coast and where the family finally got this, the city to pay them for the land that was taken from them, what's going on in New York City with, with um, the, the, the park, that sections of that park, that beautiful park was owned by black people and now it's like, it was taken from them. Now, was it your fault? Was it my fault? Were we there? No. But guess what? We are stewards of what has been passed down to us. We may not have a legal obligation, but do we have a moral obligation? Are we in position to repair some of the damages that were done? And my answer to that is yes. So we continue to have those type of dialogue and those questions on nomenclature and what it means to name something what it really was. Hi, so I am um, a current master's student and one of my research interests is preservation of African-American sites. So with this site being demolished two times, what were the unique challenges that you faced in finding artifacts and archival materials and things like that to put this type of exhibit and this museum together? Um, excellent question. So that was probably the biggest challenge for us. We did not, for the most part, have artifacts. Uh, literally everything was destroyed um, and things that we wanted, 
Um, no one in 2016, well, I think 2012, is when they began discussing the work of the Smithsonian creating an African American Museum of History and Culture. Um, so they really turned on the vacuum <laughs> and everything went to them. And no one was thinking, hey, Tulsa, Oklahoma might want to build a museum of their own. Uh, and so maybe we should save some of those artifacts. So things like uh, the typewriter that uh, John Hope Franklin, uh, B.C. Franklin, the father of John Hope Franklin, B.C. Franklin was the black attorney that immediately after the, the, um, the, mass, the, the massacre and the event, the city of Tulsa, the city council, to keep black citizens from rebuilding their home, they created an ordinance. And the ordinance says it is illegal for you to rebuild your home or your business if you cannot do it with fireproof retardant materials. And so it was done to basically keep them from being able to afford to rebuild their home. And if you don't build your home in a certain amount of time, okay, we claim intimate domain and we're going to take the land, which is really what they wanted. B.C. Franklin actually set up a tent in a legal office in a tent city. And there's, there's a picture of bricks, his desk, and his typewriter where he files a brief and claims that that law was, was unlawful. It goes all the way to the Oklahoma State Supreme Court and he won. That in and of itself, a black man <laughs> made a case go to the Oklahoma Supreme Court in that time period and won. Um, if it wasn't for B.C. Franklin, we wouldn't have, Greenwood would not have built. And the typewriter that he filed that brief on is sitting in a case in Washington, D.C., and I want it so bad. But they have all the artifacts. And so what we have, the most cherished artifact, are the narrative stories, the witness, the testimonies of the living survivors that were living uh, in 1997 to 2001. There was a five-year study, the Oklahoma State Commission to study the Tulsa race, mass, race riot, where all the information we have now came out of that commission. And one of the things they did, Eddie Faye Gates, a black history teacher, wanted to know if there were any survivors that were still living in 1997, and there were about 24 still living. Most of them were in nursing homes, but there were about nine that she was able to gather together. They were still lucid in their memories. They were in their 80s, 90s, some of them 100 years old. They're all passed away now, but we have her recordings of her saying, what happened to you to that day? And it's their witness account. I was nine years old. I was 18 years old. I was six years old at the time of the massacre. And they go through this detail. And inside Green Rising, you hear them tell their story. It is the most valuable artifact that we have because it's, it's actual live witness statements. So yeah, we don't have a lot of artifacts from that era. The 1940s, 50s, and 60s, of course, we have a lot, but the pre-era uh, of artifacts. So we are not an artifacts museum like the Freedom Center. We're really, a, that's why we refer to ourselves as a history center, because the truest sense of being a museum, you're collecting artifacts. We really don't have those artifacts. Um, we tell a story. We are a narrative museum, much like the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. I think we got time for one more. Yeah, just time for one more question. So, well, first, thank you for coming out and sharing the story. I think it's very important. Um, and your project, telling that story, helping people to remember, uh, is very important so folks can really appreciate the great injustice that occurred that was government sanctioned mm -hmm. and by agents of the government that mm -hmm. did that. And you used the word reparations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. several times, and I think you even mentioned that it's not just a check. But there mm -hmm. needs to be a check cut mm -hmm. for those descendants. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to yep. if your project is engaged in that work mm -hmm. or if there's mm -hmm. other folks in mm -hmm. the Tulsa community mm -hmm. working on that, what's currently yeah. happening? Yeah, yeah. 100% 100, 100 uh, concur and agree with you. Um, the role of reparations, um, the, the commission report that I referred to, uh, the young lady there, the Oklahoma State Commission, this is another one of those buried histories. The Oklahoma State Congress in 1997 created the Oklahoma State Commission to study the Tulsa race riot of 1921. It was a bipartisan commission. Um, the Oklahoma uh, head of the uh, Oklahoma Historic Society was, was named as a chair, but it existed for five years. They were tasked with this, this um, um, uh, I guess, uh, demand from the state fact find, go find the truth about what happened, do your research, and then return your research with suggestions, recommendations of what the state should do. 
taxpayer dollars. Five-year study, 200-page paper. It is one of the, and it's actually, by the way, it is free for download. You can actually go to Oklahoma Historical Society, uh, Oklahoma State Commission, or Race Riot Report, and you can actually download it. It's 200 pages, very exhaustive, excellently done. And it came back with, with recommendation number one, direct cash reparations are deserving of the uh, direct descendants and families of the massacre. This is 1997. Um, memorials should be built so that people never forget this. This is where we are now, but I'll get back to that. Number three, educational scholarships should be set up so that students and direct descendant children from this era should never have to pay to go to school in Oklahoma. Um, number four, economic development fund be set up to rebuild and economically reinvest into the business area of agreement. That was 20, now 21 years ago. And to this day, not one piece of public policy legislation has been done to certify the report because this is something that people don't know about and it's quiet. What Greenwood Rising Museum does is create this world-class history center that brings the world in. I'm, it might be difficult for me to get you to read a 200-page paper, but you'll walk through a museum. And once I capture your heart and you see this story and you immersively understand it, man, there's a paper on this. Then people want to go read the paper. And then the pressure, the worldwide pressure on Tulsa now is overwhelming. The last year and a half, the city itself has created uh, oversight committees and commissions to, to because the vast majority of the land that uh, was Greenwood is owned by the city of Tulsa that they were able to grab over the 60s, 70s, and 80s after eminent domain. And now they have created all African American oversight committees as they are redeveloping. How do we redevelop a place called the Evans Fin Tube site? How do we redevelop? master plan redevelopment community to create an opportunity for increased black home ownership, increased black owning of property, increasing black businesses, and they're putting the city resources behind it um, and development work is being done. Now this is the long, the thing about this is this is the hardest work and it's the longest work because you're not just gonna flip a switch and next year there's buildings and there's houses and there's developed land. This is a five, 10, 15 year process. The challenge is getting community citizens to understand that it's coming and three years from now, not saying, oh, they ain't building nothing, not doing anything. It takes that amount of time to invest in the plans that they have going forward. It is happening and yes, the. City of Tulsa is under a lawsuit now by an attorney by the name of Demario Solomon Simmons. He created something called the Justice for Greenwood Fund. Um, and he actually filed a, a brief a year and a half ago to bring the city and bring those who were in existence at that time. Um, and a judge is looking at the case now to determine um, eminent domain, I'm, not, I'm sorry, um, the, uh, the, the law case that kept reparations from being paid um, was statute of limitations. Until the United States and Oklahoma changes statute of limitations, there is a limit on how long you can sue someone for damages. That's why it's, you can't get around it. Legally, you can't get around it. What he has found is the nuisance, a nuisance law, the law that was used so that drug companies who invested and dropped fentanyl and Oxycontin in these communities and destroyed communities and created a nuisance and got these $200, $300 million lawsuits, he's using that case. He's using that plight, that what happened in 1921 has been a continual nuisance to Greenwood and what happened and these entities are responsible for it and they owe this community. Um, don't know what's gonna happen in that lawsuit, but that's where the lawsuit is in terms of what financially those that were responsible have possibly to pay this community, so. Can we give Phil a round of applause, please? I definitely want to thank everyone for being here. And before we leave, I believe uh, Phil, he has a table that's out back um, uh, that where he has some items. And, uh, and so we have a few more minutes. So I will say we will have to uh, uh, leave the building <laughs> within the next 20, 
uh, the 25 minutes, uh, but we definitely have to um, lead a theater. But before we do that, uh, Phil, if you could join me. Um, you know, the story about what's, that story about the community of Greenwood is very similar to what occurred here in the state of Ohio. Uh, you talked about the first pieces of legislation. The first piece of Ohio legislature were the Black Codes of 1804. And so we live in a community and society now where we're tired of talking about race. But the stories, the truth and history shows that we've always made race a priority through policy, through legislation, and we can't escape it. So we must do the work, and I appreciate the work that you are doing. Uh, if you don't know, I think somebody was about to applaud. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have a wonderful, thriving art community here in Cincinnati. And we have one of our brilliant artists that is here uh, with us. His name is Brandon Hawkins. And we want to provide uh, something to you to take back down to Greenwood. It's up to you. It would be great if you could have it somewhere on your site or whatever to do what you're choosing. Uh, but Brandon, if you could come up uh, and join us and, and share a few words as well. Thank you, Chris. Um, I have to thank you because, um, you know, as an artist and somebody who has studied African and African American history, uh, there has always been, you know, pressure to make sure that whatever it is that I create tells a story and tells the right story. Um, Chris also didn't say I used to work here at the Freedom Center as a security guard, right? So some of y'all might know me. I've I've slept in almost every corner of this building at three, four, five in the morning when nobody was here. Um, but being in a place like this and knowing people like, you know, Carl Westmoreland and uh, uh, Chris and a lot of folks that came through here has given me a lot of inspiration. And what you are doing has given me a lot of inspiration, so much so that uh, here recently, my wife and I who have a, a company called Soul Palette. We were commissioned to do an exterior mural on a bank. Um, and that mural went to talking about the uh, black financial excellence of this neighborhood called Madisonville here in Cincinnati. And the, uh, the piece was called the Black Dollar. And inside the building, there are other pieces of art that talk about black excellence. One of which is the piece that I'm going to give you here. And this is called Rise Greenwood Rise. So... So I actually, you know, was taught about uh, Greenwood. My father's from uh, North Carolina, so I ta was taught about uh, uh, Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, and the race riots that happened, well, not race riots, uh, the massacres that happened all over the country because black people were trying to rise up. And so knowing about Greenwood inspired me to do a piece, and this piece is, this is a print, but the original is four foot by five foot. So it's like a huge piece that has been put in a bank inside a bank. Um, and so that being said, um, this, this piece means a lot to me. Uh, what the folks in Tulsa are still going through means a lot to me. Um, so much so I think about them putting a Black Lives Matter mural down and it being stripped up immediately. Um, so I kind of also wanted to give this to you because you know here in Cincinnati, we did a Black Lives Matter mural. I was project manager over it. And I wanted to make sure that, that you all had that. Hopefully, out of light of fire, y'all can throw that thing down on the ground again, you know, and it'll last longer. So, but I want to say thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate you. So, yeah. So I'm going to let Phil, um, he's going to go up to the table. Um, I just want quickly, I, ain't, there's not too much I can say to bring this evening. I hope this is a meaningful experience for you. For those that registered, 
Uh, you should have in your inbox a link to a survey. Please take that survey. Let us know how we did tonight. Uh, let us know your feelings about this experience uh, and that, that feedback will be greatly appreciated. I want to encourage you to join us for our continued program. Visit freedomcenter.org uh, for information about upcoming programs as we continue to bring meaningful, crucial uh, 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 programming to our community uh, to bring national leaders, thought perspectives from in the city and outside of the city. Thank you once again for spending your time with us. Be blessed. Thank you.